I will keep the bad things from you. And it's sung by a songwriter named Alex Gazin. And at what point, you can hear him turning the page. He's sitting there with his guitar, and he's doing this song, and he doesn't even know the words. He's just written it, apparently. He's just discovering it. it'll never be as real for him as at that moment. He turns the page, and you hear the whoosh, and you want to cry. Also, I bought some software that I used to save the flash video of Sinead O'Connor on YouTube doing her live rendition of She Moved to the Fair, which is even better than the one on iTunes. So I was moving forward in a sense. And Ross said, but sweetie, you're spending all this money. We don't have it. And that's true, we didn't have it. Back in the 90s, I took a swoosh at the stock market with money I got from my grandfather, and I did well for a while. That's when I met Roz and she moved in. I bought some shares of Koss Corporation, the headphone company. Then I split the Harry Root Ball, and I bought some Canon depository receipts. Then I split that Harry Root Ball. I bought Mac Store and then sold it. I bought stock in a tiny company called Bios, and it doubled in a day and a half. Then I bought lots of bad stocks over several years, and all the money shrank away, more or less. Roz was supporting us now, except for an equity loan on my house and a chunk of money I borrowed from my sister, who's not that rich. If or when I handed in the introduction to only one, I'd get $7,000 because my editor, Gene, is very generous. Apart from that, there was almost nothing due. Just the odd thousand in honoraria here and there from book reviews or readings or panel discussions, like the one coming up in Switzerland. <laughs> I can't teach. I tried it once at Hafner College and it practically unhinged me. <laughs> I said to Roz, I know it seems excessive, a little odd, but I think this is the only way to really lay it out fresh and sing the pain. She nodded and she said, okay, but in a very small voice. I could see that she was losing faith in me and losing her love for me and her respect for me. Because <clears throat> who wants to be forced into the role of enforcer? Roz was a writer herself and an editor. She wasn't a doubter and a prodder. She wasn't some calendar-tapping scold. She actually liked my poem, Smooth Motion. She was first attracted to me because of it, I think. At least, she wasn't attracted to me for my looks because I'm not smooth. In fact, I'm pretty rough-looking, although I've lost some weight recently. And once Ross did say that I looked good in a certain subtly hound's-toothed jacket that she helped me pick out. <laughs> she hadn't reckoned on my having, on having to be forever poking me to get me to write one 40-page introduction to an anthology. And she didn't want to be arguing over money. And she wanted to adopt a child, and I didn't. Why? I don't know. I see these horribly spoiled, rude, selfish kids. I don't want to risk being the father of them. <laughs> but I think if I'd just written even a tiny five-line poem about an inchworm on my panel, it would have been fine. Anything, something. Ross commuted all the way to Concord to work for an alternative newspaper, but I think it would have been all right with her to support us for a little while, as long as I was getting actual work accomplished. But when I came down, empty-handed from the barn at the end of the second week, that's when I really wounded her. She was standing in the hall, putting her keys in her purse, beautifully made up, smelling clean from her shower. She looked up and she said, bravely, so can I read it? And I felt this horrible inner sensation. My caramel clusters of self were liquefying and pooling in the warmth of their own guilt. I said, I'm sorry, I mean, I don't have anything. And that was it. My beautiful, patient, funny, short, <laughs> loving girlfriend, the woman I'd been with longer than anyone else, moved out. She was right to leave me, but it, it felt really bad. Horrible, in fact. Plus, I was broke.
So here's a little bit from later on. <coughs> this is totally, totally, totally not autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> I went back up to the second floor of the barn and I sat in the white plastic chair and I sweated because it's hot and I thought, you can't force it. If it isn't there, you can't force it. Then I thought, you can force it. My whole life I've been forcing it. You throw yourself against the weight of the massive sliding door to the barn that doesn't want to move and you lean and you wag your hips and you haul on the metal handle and you strain and you grunt and you point your face at the sky and you say bad words, and it starts to move and rumble, and then it moves a little more easily, and then a little more easily still, and finally, the barn door is wide enough that you barely fit through, taking care not to scrape your back on the broken off lock flange. So you can force it, and you should force it, all the time, force it open, push, pull, when you think you can't think again. On the other hand, Sometimes the wood of the door is a little rotten around the handle, and you tear out the screws. Sometimes the door is really just stuck. The emptiness of this floor of the barn is its greatest quality. This barn is, I guess you could say, my family barn. My parents bought this house in 1961 when I was still a kid. There's a house, an L, which is the connecting structure, and the barn. And they put a new roof on the barn, which is really all you need to do. You need to keep the rain out. As soon as the roof starts to leak, the decay, the collapse, the in fungosity takes charge. You've got to have a roof on your barn. I see it over and over again, the slumping to the side. Two more payments and it's ours. You know that postcard? The first floor is a chaos, and I've been filling it with even more boxes. It's a madhouse of stored boxes. But the second floor is still quite empty. Well, right now it has the folding table with sections of my anthology on it, but it's almost empty. It will be empty soon. It will be broom clean, as they say in real estate. My broom. My broom is rotten. Over the winter it became a blackened, side-swerving, dense stump. It was almost unrecognizable. It had literally decayed. You simply cannot leave a corn broom outside over the winter. I don't know what I was thinking. I was distracted, I guess, by the anthology and by money and by things going wrong with Roz. Once I wiped snow off the windshield and then I just carelessly leaned it against the house and then a fallen roof drift covered it. What a mistake. It's a downright, it's downright painful to try to sweep with this moist stump of a broom. I called Tim and I said to my friend Tim, I said, I'm just very worried that they may have stopped making brooms like this because people all seem to own these little plastic brooms now. Tim said he was pretty sure that he'd seen similar classic corn brooms for sale at Target recently. So I went to Target to the broom aisle. And Tim was absolutely right. I just assumed that the old style would, wouldn't be there anymore, but it was. It's made by the Libman Company and it's still made in the United States. And I came home, tore off the plastic, and there was the same smocking, the same tight spiral of shining wire. I slid aside the doormat and whistled at all the sand that had clicked it under there, and I swept it clean away. Then I drove to Roz's place to tell her that I'd gotten a new broom. I saw her getting out of the car with a man. She was dressed up. Crike. And yet, of course, you should. If you break up with someone, then you go out with someone else. While I was gone, the mouse in the kitchen found half an old cookie and tried to pull it up into the stove's control panel, which is where he lives. But the cookie wouldn't fit. So he just ate it where it was. Ate and shat discreetly and had quite a little party. I made an egg salad sandwich and took a bite of it over the open silverware drawer. <laughs> this is autobiographical. <laughs> a piece of egg salad fell in among the forks. I swore softly with my mouth full. Another piece of egg salad fell in. At first I was going to leave the bits there.